So today I'm joined by Michael Wilson Katsivas of CAP, K-A-P, who is in Los Angeles, and Ben Adams of BAA, who's here in London. The two of them collaborate on projects in cities as diverse as Cairo, Palm Springs, and Milan. Michael used to work at BAA and trained at the AA, the Architectural Association. So we, we thought it would be interesting to discuss a number of key issues around urban change in both Los Angeles and London, and uh, some of the lessons that can be learned from both cities. So let's first talk about density. As I understand it, new metro stations in LA are triggering, triggering a burst of new development at higher densities and in a, a mix of uses that is new to uh, the city, but quite common in London. So Michael, can you give us uh, 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 some words about the context? And isn't public transport quite new to the city, uh, the city of the automobile anyway? Yeah, um, well, it is and it isn't. Um, LA did have an extensive network of streetcars 100 years ago, 20 years ago, that got ripped up by the automobile manufacturers. So, it, and then obviously with the advent of the car, which was the future at that time, uh, there was an extensive network of highways and auto routes that were built throughout the city. Um, LA is actually investing heavily in infrastructure. Um, I remember reading an article recently uh, written in the New York Times about how outraged New Yorkers are that someplace like Los Angeles is spending more money on metro stations than New York is. One of the, the most interesting things that Los Angeles has done is to provide uh, incentives to developers or people building apartment buildings and such to provide more units, more density, bigger buildings, if they provide affordable housing next to a metro station or uh, infrastructure transit hub. So <clears throat> those incentives become very interesting and that's why we're seeing more uh, you know, taller buildings, more denser buildings appearing around certain neighborhoods in Los Angeles. Um, not to say, you know, the American dream of the single family home is still alive and well, they're, they're definitely kind of have those aspirations. So it's quite unique in Los Angeles to be driving through a, you know, a very low rise single family home neighborhood and all of a sudden, you know, a 20 story tower appears out of nowhere because there's a metro station next door. So it's really changing that fabric between the kind of, you know, the single family home and, you know, what people consider downtown areas or denser areas of the city. Um, so that, that's an interesting thing that's happening and, and it is happening around metro stations because of these incentives that the city is offering to uh, developers to provide affordable housing. Um, California has also recently passed or trying to pass a law which get rid of you know single family homes uh, throughout the whole entire state so anyone can build two units on one lot. Uh, so even out in the middle of nowhere in the you know in the rural ruralist parts of California, you could build two homes and sell them separately on one lot. So it's an interesting thing that they're trying to do address, not only with, you know, this well-documented California has a housing crisis that they're trying to address through all these means. So they're, they're, those are kind of, you know, the context that Los Angeles is working with in, in the moment. So Ben, uh, can you give me your thoughts on similar things that are happening in London, but driven by slightly different pressures, I think? Yeah, it's interesting in London that we've, we've had a green belt since 1930 and we've had a drive to high density because London has become a, a larger city. We don't really have the choice of spreading outwards as a city like Los Angeles has done historically. Um, we, we have to build upwards. Um, and we've seen that uh, in, in clusters in the city of London, in Canary Wharf. Um, and locally, we've seen, you know, single storey extensions appear on so many buildings um, all over London. Um, but more recently, we've seen larger developments with uh, people aggregating smaller sites, uh, taking a look at them in the round and thinking, do we really need a collection of two or three warehouses um, and some, some older buildings? Or, or should we think uh, in a bigger way about this site? Um, and with a focus uh, on housing, as Michael has said, and particularly if affordable housing, and there's seemingly endless need for affordable housing in London, um, and, and affordability is, is only going in one direction over time, even through COVID and, and, and now. Um, but new developments are bringing at least 35% affordable homes with them. Uh, so that, that drive for density is, is beneficial to the city, I think, in, in lots of ways. Um, 
new homes for sale, new homes for rent, and new homes for affordability. It feels like a a genuine sort of win-win um, that we're seeing in 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 many parts of London. Um, Elephant Castle uh, is well documented. Um, if you've been through Lewisham and that part of town recently, you'll see uh, a, a tower cluster appearing there. Croydon um, has finally, you know, seen large-scale redevelopment around uh, East Croydon Station. Um, so. Some of the factors are similar, really. It is It is to do with transport and connectivity um, into central London. Um, and it's about affordability and more homes and, and, and the things that come with that. Uh, retail, restaurants, um, placemaking, um, all of that good stuff. So I think we're seeing similar um, impacts in London and Los Angeles, but from, from different pressures, uh, uh, as you said at the outset. Um, but interestingly, we're starting to see similar buildings and building types emerge in both cities, which is new. Um, you know, historically, LA was was single-story um, individual plots uh, that got built on, um, and then zoning for other stuff. Um, but it's very much a city of mixed-use, taller buildings now um, it, that would be familiar to Londoners, um, and that is that is very new um, and exciting. Michael, you said that walkability is now a key metric in choosing a home uh, to buy or rent in LA. How did that come about? LA is notorious for its commuting and its car-based culture. You know, a two-hour journey to and from work was not an uncommon thing for a lot of people. Uh, so I think this desire to you know, take a break from that, um, you know, that transit life and be able to live in a community where you can walk to all the necessity shops, restaurants, bars, all the great things about life has become a quite a strong desire for people living in Los Angeles just to get that break. So you, you have this kind of interesting thing where there are, and not too dissimilar to London, you know, London is a collection of villages that grew into the city over time and LA is very similar in that way. I mean, they're, they're further spread out these centers in London, but it is a collection of you know, different cities and different neighborhoods that have kind of grown together over time. So, you know, there's 20 different cities all within LA County and they all kind of function as the Los Angeles metro area. So each of those cities has its own, you know, shopping area, its own dining area, its own kind of little downtown area. And people want to live in, in close to those things. And, you know, it's kind of this thing, you don't see your friends during the weekend because you want to hang out and, you know, you don't want to drive two hours to go anywhere. So. Um, that's kind of, yeah, I think that's kind of where it started happening. I think there's, there's been a strong appreciation, the desire to really start growing those neighborhoods and kind of, you know, have this mixed-use development. So that's something that's encouraged by the city and by the city planners quite, quite greatly. And ben, uh, active travel, of course, is growing in London. How, how does your experience uh, compare with uh, that of LA? I think what I've noticed in LA and was surprised by was the number of cyclists on the road and the number of cycleways along the coast up into the mountains and, and just the enthusiasm for cycling and, and walking within your neighbours as Michael has said and we've seen the same, same thing in London really accelerated by uh, lockdown and the opportunity the mayor and others took to just open up cycle routes and reduce um, road lanes all over central and suburban London very suddenly. There was a certain amount of pushback at, at all these bike lanes appearing, um, but there are huge volumes of new and um, experienced cyclists as a result and pedestrians. And um, the thing I notice in, in, in walking and cycling across town is that it is now by far the quickest way to get from A to B. Um, if you're in Southwark, where, where I am at the moment in my studio, and you need to visit uh, Mayfair or the City of London um, or anywhere in North London, then um, cycling is, is definitely the quickest way to get there, and walking is a close second. Um, and getting in a car is a lottery. You know, it, it could take an hour, it could take several hours. Um, so it's become a sort of necessity here. Um, but I think that's also true in Los Angeles. One, one of the most frustrating things about car journeys is the, is the unpredictability of them. Um, in the, if you time it right, uh, you can travel 20 miles in 20 minutes. And if you're unfortunate, that same trip can take an hour and a half. So you very often have to leave an hour and a half um, just in case. And it, it's a really inefficient way of getting around. 
Um, but because of that, I think that the same lessons are being learned there that we've learned here, that there are other ways to get around the city for most people, and they're more pleasant um, and generally more active. Um, and I think the real difference is just the scale. Uh, LA is about four times the area of London and about 50% more people. So it's significantly more spread out. And it leads to a concentration that Michael has mentioned, that people do stay within their neighbourhood. Um, you know, if you live in Santa Monica, you tend to sort of hang out there and you might go to Venice because it's, you know, it's a mile away. Um, but you're not going to cross town because it takes forever. And I think that's true of London. I've always thought of London as a, a sort of mosaic city. Uh, I'm sure we've all had friends who've moved from, I don't know, Highgate to... Uh, Bromley and, and and maybe never been seen again uh, because <laughs> you know the journey just becomes a significant one. Um, so yeah, comparisons there and, and, and differences. London is is certainly more compact, certainly central London, um, but that pattern of neighbourhoods and villages is, is is common to both. I would say. Yeah, I have a friend who's moving to Manhattan Beach, which is. 15 miles away from my house, but it takes two hours to get there. And she texted me and say, are you ever going to come visit me? You know, <laughs> that's the kind of mentality. It is the same thing in London, exactly like Ben said, when I lived in London, I had a friend who lived in Notting Hill and I asked him to meet me in Tottenham Court Road. And he said, that's way too far east. You must be out of your mind. So <laughs> those are the same mentalities that people have, you know, that, that, I think that, you know, living in your neighborhood and, you know, someplace New York that does have fantastic infrastructure, I think people travel around New York in a much different way than they do in other cities. Ben, you're, you're working on a, a mixed-use building in Lambeth at the moment. And uh, what are you learning from Los Angeles for your uh, it's Graphite Square building in Lambeth? Yeah, Graphite is, is a good case, I think. It's a building of uh, 15 stories in height, a mixture of... Um, homes, uh, workplace, outdoor space, uh, space for children and so on, and a church. And so it does have a similar brief to an LA building. And I think what we've learned is that um, because the, the big lots in LA are, are, are very large, um, you, you can design that sort of 24 hour, seven days a week building. And there is a mentality in, in, in the city towards not leaving uh, your building um, for days at a time. If it, if it contains everything you might want to do for a few days, then you will uh, live, work and play there because it's convenient. Um, and it's not in a sort of gated or exclusive way. It's, it's just about practicality often that it's, it's convenient to go downstairs and get a cup of coffee because it's a good coffee shop. There's someone to sit and there's a nice view. And then you might, you know, go upstairs again because you've got some work to do. And I think that that sort of open, we call them city units that have kind of everything you might need within them, but no obligation to stay, um, are fascinating. Because um, we've seen the, the, the perhaps negative version of that in the very locked down uh, buildings that have lots of things in them, but you, you know, the barrier to entry is quite high. But what we're seeing now is the open version of that, where there's, there's a whole load of stuff at ground floor that's completely public and for anyone to use. And, and the further you go up the building, it's, it's dependent on, on what you need to do. You know, if you work in the building, then you'll have a pass and you'll go up and work. And if you live in the building, you'll have a, a door key and do the same thing. And I like that sort of layering. It's something we can learn from LA, but it's something we can learn a huge amount from, from really vertical cities like, um, Hong Kong uh, or other parts of Southeast Asia, Tokyo, Osaka, you know, they've, they've had that sort of vertical living and working for a long time out of necessity. Um, and there it all started again with transit hubs. You know, you build a railway station and there's an expectation that there'll be several other things above it and lots of ground floors um, that do different things. And uh, that's where I think our cities need to go. You know, there's no no problem with that kind of density and complexity as long as it's um, well designed and, and sensitive. It, it's really exciting. Thank you both very much for your insights. Uh, uh, really interesting. Perhaps we should organise a longer conversation sometime because NLA does often have uh, sessions where we share with uh, different cities. We do a lot with New York. So I think we should obviously plan a longer one for Los Angeles at some stage. So thank you both very much. That sounds like a great idea, and thank you for your time. It was really great speaking. 
It would be good to pick up, I think, because there's uh, it is a fabulous place.